Today on Straight Talk Africa, the challenges of U.S. foreign policy in Africa. That discussion is coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America headquarters here in Washington, D.C. I am Sheka Sali, and today we are discussing the challenges and opportunities of U.S. foreign policy in Africa. In December 2018, the administration of U.S. President Donald Trump unveiled a new U.S. Africa policy focused on combating what they say are the predatory practices of China and Russia. My colleague, Paul Ndiho, has more. The United States has a new U.S.-Africa strategy, as announced in December by National Security Advisor John Bolton. The announcement came during a speech at the Heritage Foundation, an American conservative think tank based in Washington, D.C., that is primarily geared towards a public policy. Bolton challenged African governments to choose the United States over China and Russia for their commercial, security, and political relations. Under our new Africa strategy, we will target U.S. funding toward key countries and particular strategic objectives. All U.S. aid on the continent will advance U.S. interest and help African nations move toward self-reliance. President Trump's critics say noticeably absent from the new plan is any commitment to democratic governance and leadership on the African continent, which is among the leading priorities for sub-Saharan Africa in 2019. According to a study published by the Brookings Institution's Africa Growth Initiative, Brahima Kruble, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, explains. The future of U.S.-Africa relations will be determined more by U.S. policies and actions uh, or lack thereof toward Africa than by those of other countries toward Africa. Despite the criticism, the U.S. administration says it's on course to engage with Africa. Last week, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo welcomed the newly elected President Felix Kisekedi of the Democratic Republic of Congo to Washington. They discussed the future of U.S. DRC relations and expressed their shared interest in partnering together to deliver a better and more prosperous future for the Congolese people. Relief and excitement are spread through Liberian communities across the United States last month after President Trump issued an executive order extending the deadline of the Deferred Enforcement Departure Program for 4,000 Liberians living in the United States to March 30th, 2020. The White House also announced that the president's daughter, Ivanka Trump, would visit Ethiopia and Ivory Coast over four days this month for a Women's Economic Empowerment Summit in Ivory Coast, led by his daughter. In February, President Trump signed the Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative that focuses on advancing female participation in the global economy. In October 2018, U.S. First Lady Melania Trump wrapped up her first visit to Africa that highlighted child welfare and promoted the work of the U.S. Agency for International Development on the continent. Her four-nation tour included stops in Ghana, Malawi, Kenya, and Egypt. In his first meeting at the White House with a sub-Saharan African leader, President Trump held talks last year with Nigerian President Mohamedou Buhari. The leaders reaffirmed and strengthened their commitment to fighting terrorism and violent extremists. President Trump also met last year with the Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta at the White House for talks on security and trade. The two leaders signed agreements that will see American companies invest in 238 million worth of projects in the East African nation. Political observers said Africa's economic and political clout is growing rapidly and the continent boasts of a younger burgeoning population which by 2050 will make up 25% of the world's population and workforce. Paul Ndiho, VOA News. Thanks, Paul, for that interesting report. Uh, joining us uh, today are three distinguished guests. 
Ambassador Ruth A. Davis, former U.S. Ambassador to Benin, Ambassador Charis Ray, former U.S. Ambassador to Zimbabwe, and Alonzo Fulgham, former acting administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development. I have to say, uh, lady and gentlemen, that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the three of you on Straight Talk Africa for the first time. Thank you. Happy to, to be, be here. here. Happy Great to, be, to here. be here. You're most welcome. Now, let me come to you immediately, Ambassador Davis, uh, playing the potential extraordinary. <laughs> Do you mind if at some point uh, I can refer you by your first name? Please Ruth? do. Yes, I'm more comfortable like that. Thank you very much. You've been to the African continent in the business, of course, of uh, selling U.S. foreign policy to Benin, in particular, where you were the top uh, official. How was it like? Well, you know... First of all, you're right, I've been to Africa, and I love Africa. Africa is a part of my soul. And when I was ambassador to Benin, I felt like I was working for history. It wasn't a job. It was a love. It was something that was necessary to bring the U.S. and to bring... Uh, Benin closer together. And I must say that uh, my Beninese interlocutors, uh, President Soglo, his cabinet, they were all very, very interested in relationships with the U.S. I, uh, you know, I've watched relationships with Africa change over the years. We had President Clinton, who focused on uh, trade and brought us a Goa. Then we had President Bush, who focused on, uh, who focused on HIV AIDS, eliminating HIV AIDS, which was really a, a wonderful thing with, through PEPFAR. Then we had Obama, who focused on youth, which is the salvation of our world, I think, and also power Africa. So it, it's been very, very interesting to watch all of the changes. Very interesting. Uh, what about you, um, Ambassador Charis Ray, playing the potential, extraordinary? What was your experience like uh, in Zimbabwe? Well, in Zimbabwe, when I was there, relations between the U.S. and Zimbabwe were not at their best. Uh, there were tensions. What I focused on, though, was to, to work past the tensions and to look for those areas of mutual benefit, uh, in particular, looking at what I think my main mission was, which was to, to look out for the interests of American citizens and American companies in Zimbabwe uh, as in the first instance and then to to engage with the Zimbabweans both the political sector and the private sector on how that country could could move toward a more inclusive participatory uh, style of governing and improve its economy um, I'd have to say it was a, a mixed mixed bag there were times when it was very frustrating uh, there were other times when it was very, very much enriching uh, and rewarding. Um, we, we were able, at least for a brief period of time, to, 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 get a, to get more action on a part of the private sector, to get the government to recognize that, that it had to, to basically have a very light touch when dealing with the private sector to allow it to, to expand and grow. Um, we did some, uh, I, I think, frankly, amazing work with the PEPFAR program, working in coordination with the Zimbabweans of all political parties 
uh, to, to, to deal with the AIDS epidemic there uh, and some rural development programs, which, which I'm very proud of, which changed the lives of some people in some of the more depressed rural areas of Zimbabwe. So all in all, I would say the positive probably outweighed the negative. Uh, I mean, the, the, the uh, going back to what Ambassador Davis was saying about, about the, the U.S. policy of various administrations, and I agree with her, in each of the administrations she mentioned had some, some very necessary and I think very beneficial mm. policy initiatives. But over the years, my experience uh, as a diplomat has been primarily in other parts of the world. My only other African experience was Sierra Leone. And, 1991 to, to uh, 93 to 1996, but my observation has been that our that our policy focus in Africa quite often has been been too narrowly focused mm -hmm. and too short term focused. Uh, and other than the things that have been mentioned, AGOA, PEPFAR, quite often focused on the wrong things. Uh, before the end of the Cold War, our main focus was competition with the Soviet Union. And we are again now looking at competition with China with and with Russia. And the Russians. Uh, the problem with that is it, it narrows our view to, to a certain menu of things, uh, some of which don't often benefit the people of the countries of Africa, and in fact some that often work to their detriment. But, but one of the things that it does do, and this is the experience or my observation in talking to many of my African colleagues in the countries that I visited or worked in, is that by, fo by having our focus on competition with an external power rather than, than focusing on the countries themselves, mm. we insult and anger not the, just the governments, but the people, because in a way they see this as as minim, minimizing or marginalizing them. We they are seen as pawns in this this game between the two big players. And it was the African saying, "When the elephants fight, the grass gets trampled." trampled. Well, I think some <laughs> of these in some of these countries, people feel like grass. We, we so I, this is just my perspective. We need to, I think. We need to continue to do those humanitarian things that lift people out of misery and poverty. But we also need to have a broader, more long-term focus on dealing with Africa. Ambassador Davis said it, that, that, or, or, or your colleague, uh, in a few decades, 25 percent of the world's youth and working population will be on the African continent. If we don't provide opportunities for those people. That's a huge pool of potential recruits for extremist views and extremist organizations, which affects our national security quite directly. It also inhibits and impedes the development of the continent. So we need to join with governments and with the people in Africa to take a longer term view of how can the countries of Africa develop, take more responsibility for themselves, provide more for their people. And, and oh, by the way, I mean, one of the things, and maybe this is because I'm not an Africa hand, I, I, I try not to talk about Africa unless I'm talking about the continent. And I always qualify it by saying the countries of Africa, because there are more than 60 countries, and I've lost count of the number of languages and ethnic groups. I, this is a thing I think we also need to do is to start looking at Africa for the diverse demographic, geographic, ethno-linguistic system mm -hmm. that it is and not thinking of it as, as this single large entity called Africa because no such thing exists. You're right because uh, there are people for some strange reason when they think about Africa they think about the continent as if it is a country. Yeah. And you're right, it has so many countries. Uh, the last uh, time I checked, it has 54 countries which are members of the African Union. And plus, 
Western Sahara, yes. which is contested, there could be 55. Let me come to you, uh, Alonzo Fulgham. What about you? You told me just before we came here that you had a great time in a country that was once known as Swaziland. Swaziland, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably one of the greatest experiences of my life as an African-American. Uh, had a chance to go there as an aid officer to work on private sector development there. But arriving in South Africa, as our apartheid was still in place, it was a year before Mandela was, uh, President Mandela was released from jail. It gave me, uh, as an African-American, only reading the New York Times and the Washington Post, understanding what was happening in Southern Africa. It gave me an opportunity to be on the ground. Uh, ingratiated myself with some of the, uh, the key leaders of the country while I was there. Had a chance to dance in the Reed Dance. Really? Uh, the royal crawl. The read ceremony. Yeah, we're in ceremony. <laughs> uh, went to the royal crawl uh, and uh, knew the king personally at the time. Uh, Prince Uncle Kello, uh, who was working at the central bank, took me under his wing and really gave me an opportunity to understand Swazi society, but also to understand the politics in the region. And it helped to ground the work that I was doing there from an economic growth standpoint. What are the things we needed to do to try to ingratiate, ingrain, or create an opportunity? for the Swazis to participate in the economic growth of the region. As you know, at the time, SADC was in play. They were talking about a regional railway from um, Zimbabwe through South Africa, Malawi, down to Uganda. Uh, and those were the exciting times in the region where you saw Africa rising up and potentially being a major player on the world stage, not just in Africa. Mm. At the time, if you remember, uh, Zimbabwe was a net exporter of food in the region as well as other places. So they were basket, a leader. Yes. Yeah, uh, they were the breadbasket of Southern Africa, remember that. Uh, and having a chance to travel um, in, in South Africa with uh, my Nigerian colleague Solomon Akpata at the time, who was a former Olympian, uh, he was head of UNDP, uh, encouraged me to travel in South Africa with him and his wife and my wife at the time. Uh, and then we got a chance to really see the signs, whites only. For the first time, I'd seen it in a museum really? my whole life. It was the first time to go to a beach in Durban. You must have see. seen it, of course, uh, in some books here, especially with regards but it's to Jim different. Crow. Yeah, you can read it in a book, but to see it up close and personal, standing yes. next to it and know that it could be enforced mm. if they didn't know you were an American. Mm. Uh, so those opportunities really helped me to, to, to sit down and start to design programs through USAID that were really going to provide empowerment opportunities for women create microfinance programs that would get credit to individuals who had been left out of the process, and also design programs that would help move them along the economic cont uh, continuum. Well, now, let me come to you again, uh, Ruth, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, what about the fact that uh, you enjoy historical cultural ties with that beautiful mother continent of Africa? Oh, you're absolutely right. Uh, you find that an asset, or, or is it a liability, or both? Well, you know, I think it, 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 it's an important asset. And the reason that I am so uh, excited about Africa and so excited about the potential of Africa is, listen, we live in a very Eurocentric society. Everything from Europe is good. And what I'm waiting for is for Africa to continue to develop its potential so that people can understand how great that continent is. And it reflects on how African Americans are perceived. So it's extraordinarily important. What do you mean exactly when you say, at least there is a perception that uh, everything from Europe is good, by obviously the, 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 the implication here is that uh, perhaps everything from Africa is not good. No, no, that's, uh, that, that is not the implication at all. The implication is that what I'm trying to uh, convey mm. is that this is a very sort of Eurocentric society. Mm. It has not focused on Africa, except for some segments of the society, have focused on Africa. Uh, and that actually brings me to one of the things that uh, I hope that you'll indulge me to talk about. 
and that is the cyclone, uh, Cyclone E-Day, uh, that has just happened. It's very important for me that people in uh, Southern Africa know that not only has the U.S. government been involved in assisting, granting assistance, but that other people, American citizens, are very interested and very concerned about the devastation that has been uh, wrecked on Southern Africa. For instance, um, I am the vice chair of the uh, Black American Ambassadors Association. And once the hurricane struck, we very quickly uh, got our forces together and wrote to many members of the Congress to say that not only do we want you to send your uh, condolences, mm -hmm. but we want to also send material goods to help with the, uh, w with the cleanup after the, uh, after the cyclone. And also, I am the uh, chair of the International Mission of Mercy, mm. USA, <clears throat> we are giving funding to the Convoy of Hope to help them uh, with the uh, cleanup efforts. So, so what is the reaction so far from Congress? Uh, the re actually, we've, uh, the reaction has been good. I guess it always could be better, but uh, Ambassador Nichols has just uh, announced that $2.5 million extra have been allocated uh, for, uh, for the hurricane. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, the cyclone. What about the Trump administration? Oh, what, <coughs> what, what do you mean? What, what about? would you like uh, to see it do? Uh, in terms of uh, assisting those affected by the cyclone? Well, uh, one of the things, as I said, that I'm very proud uh, about the U.S. government, and I think Alonzo can probably talk about how we generally uh, respond to disasters like that, very quickly uh, we uh, assembled what we call a DART team, mm. the disaster, what's it called? Uh, DART team, disaster relief. Disaster relief team, <clears throat> and sent it immediately uh, to uh, Mozambique in that area. We also sent in uh, planes from uh, Africa, uh, AFRICOM, AFRICOM. Mm -hmm. AFRICOM to uh, bring in uh, a couple of water purification systems, blankets, all of the things that are needed. So I think that we are uh, responding a as I would like to see. I, as I said, you can always do more, mm -hmm. but I do believe... Uh, yeah. you know, the ambassador is absolutely correct. I mean, um, it, this is not a political issue for our country. The United States whenever there's an emergency, we always step up. Uh, I think to date, the uh, countries have provided about $53 billion uh, for the assistance to, uh, to the, the, the zone. Mm. Uh, and I think that when you look at the logistics <coughs> that, uh, that the ambassador talked about, the people that have to be put in place, there's a DART team that, that sets up about seven to 10 members who go out immediately and start to identify what are the needs in the, in, in the particular countries. Because it, it can't be everybody wants to send things. We have to be able to have what they call a push and a pull. The pull comes from the country and identifies the things that are going to be needed in order to help the emergency response. Mm -hmm. If everybody loads up their, 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 their planes with things that aren't needed, it clogs up the runway that are landing planes and you can't get the real assistance that you need. The first 48 hours, 72 hours of an emergency are the most important times because you're trying to, first of all, stabilize get shelter in place, get food in place, and get water in place. And you need to be able to do that very, very quickly. Uh, and logistics, our U.S. military does that, no better, nobody does it better than they do. Uh, I, I, I mean, I hate to brag, but mm -hmm. you look at over the years, they've been able to do that without impunity. And we've been training 
with the United States Agency for International Development, DART teams over the years. So there's, a, there's an integrated approach to the problem. And so that process needs to now, I think, be uh, articulated in Africa, in Southern Africa. We all realize that there are going to be more emergencies going forth. How do you then start to get the Africans to take responsibility and create regional centers so that you don't have to always bring everything from Pisa or Dubai, that you've got things in the region? So East Africa, I think, has the capability to do that as well as Southern Africa hmm. because the, the, the response time is always vitally important. So if you can start to do those things in the coordinating meetings and training exercises, I think you'll save more lives that way. Ambassador Ray, uh, you were a U.S. ambassador to Zimbabwe. Yes. Zimbabwe is one of those uh, three countries that uh, have been affected, very badly affected. But Zimbabwe also happens to be one of those countries that uh, is under sanctions. Well, I would assume that, uh, as was just said, that, that in, in a case of an emergency where people's lives are at stake, uh, we make exceptions, exceptions. Uh, in order to, to save lives. And, and I, I would totally agree with, with what was said. I mean, we have always stepped up in these crises to, to help people, and, and that's laudable, and, 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 and we should continue to do it. I mean, it's important to address the immediate humanitarian needs. But at the same time, what I would like to see, I mean, for me, uh, and I've, I've been studying uh, severe weather phenomena for a few years now. I mean, in my retirement, I have a lot of free time. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I've been struck by is how globally these, these black swan weather events like Cyclone E-Day, which is the most severe cyclone to hit the African coast in decades. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Tokyo, Japan suffered 10 inches of snow and 47 winter-related deaths. These, these unusual climactic weather events which, which scientists have fairly conclusively linked to global warming and to climate change are occurring worldwide. They are affecting countries rich and poor. Uh, the poorer countries tend to suffer a huger human cost. Mm -hmm. But in, in even rich countries like the U.S., in the last five years, we've suffered more than $5 billion damage weather events. We had a Katrina, were, for example. Yes. Well, not Katrina, Maria, Florence. Mm -hmm. and, but you still have plenty of people here. And we're still working on cleaning up from Katrina. But and, you and, still have a lot of people here who are doubting Thomases. Well, that's, you will always have doubters and skeptics. Uh, and this is where I think having effective leadership comes in. Our but leaders. some of these people happen to be powerful. This, this, this I will not argue either. <laughs> I mean, but there needs, to be, there needs to be, uh, I, my, my, my personal feeling is that a lot of the, quote, powerful people who publicly try to debunk climate change don't do so out of belief, but do so out of a short-term political, political interest. Political gain. Political gain. What, what I feel we need to do, and, and this coming out of... of of E Day. Yes, we need to continue the humanitarian response. We need to help these people try and get their lives back together. But we also need to be sitting down with the countries in Africa and other parts of the world who are vulnerable yes. to events like this and start working with them to help them build a resiliency to survive, not just to treat the victims of the next but to survive it, the, 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 the coastal town of Burai, is that how you pronounce mm -hmm. it in Mozambique? Beira. 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 Ninety percent destroyed. Yeah. Mm. Uh, that, because it didn't have the infrastructure, it didn't have the systems to be able to withstand the winds and the, and the storm surge. We need to be... We need to be trying to focus long-term, yes, respond to emergencies when they happen, mm -hmm. but let's develop a long-term plan to survive, to snap back more quickly from these types of events because they're not going stop. to stop. 
Can I well, just add, especially in, in beta, you can't rebuild back in the same place. This is an opportunity for the government to go in and have a conversation with the community about mm. if the next cyclone comes, if you're here, the same thing is going to happen. We have to move to higher ground. And also, let's look at resiliency. How are we going to rebuild this, this town? Uh, you could cr create a competition to figure out what kinds of affordable uh, materials could be used to build a more resilient village. Right. Uh, and, and this is where you could bring your donors. You can have your young people doing a, have a contest to figure out, a competition to figure out what's the best way to rebuild that village. Unfortunately, Alonzo, time happens not to be our best ally. I'm sorry, it's a great... <laughs> Thank you <laughs> so very sorry much. about that. I just wanted... <laughs> you are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of our discussion in a moment. So please don't go away because we'll be right back with you. Is it not? On our voices, we're talking about the news and issues you're talking about. Sharing stories of development and growth across Africa, around the world, and in our lives. Topics that inform, empower, and change the rules. It's time for our voices with me, Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick, and Hadiza Kiari, and Ayan Bior, and Orion Itangi Shaka. It's time for our voices. We are able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. We hope that our viewers are getting inspired when they watch our show. They're getting a view of the world from a different perspective. Things that perhaps are not in their immediate vicinity. Today, I could put in on the show something that is a little different, a little unique. And this gives me that, uh, you know, inspiration to come to work. A reminder that we appreciate all of our audience feedback. Straight Talk Africa streams live every Wednesday on Facebook. Now let's look at what's on tap for next week's program. On the next Straight Talk Africa. During his one year in office, Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has made headlines for pushing through unprecedented reforms. But many challenges lie ahead in creating a national consensus. An in-depth discussion on the future of Ethiopia on the next Straight Talk Africa. Today we are talking about the challenges and opportunities of U.S. engagement in Africa. Our guests today are Ambassador Ruth A. Davis, former U.S. Ambassador to Benin, Ambassador Charles Ray, former U.S. Ambassador to Zimbabwe, and Alonzo Fulgham, former Acting Administrator of the United States Agency for International Development. I have to say, Ambassador Ruth and gentlemen, uh, I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled I have the opportunity to host you on Straight Talk Africa for the first time. We're very pleased to be here. You're most welcome. And let me come to you immediately. Um, when you think about uh, the policy that uh, uh, was said to be uh, like a new policy of sorts, uh, how do you, for example, compare and contrast uh, the current administration policy on Africa with the previous ones that you have been oh, part of? Well, I spoke about the various emphasis of uh, the Clinton, Bush, and uh, Obama administration. This administration, the policy as laid out by uh, National Security Advisor Bolton in December in a speech that he gave to the uh, Heritage Foundation focuses basically on, first, uh, he said, one priority was uh, trade and commercial activities. The second one was uh, combating radical Islamic terrorism. And the third is that uh, to make sure that America, the American taxpayer 
gets uh, its full value from its aid in terms of the taxpayers' f f uh, money. And also, I think he's also put an emphasis on the UN peacekeeping uh, and making sure that those peacekeeping uh, uh, ventures are done properly. So those are the emphasis that uh, Bolton has, uh, ha has laid out for the, uh, the policy of uh, this administration. And I think that, as a matter of fact, there has not been enough attention paid. Yes, the U.S. taxpayers want to get their money's worth, but uh, our money's worth is helping to uh, st stabilize African countries and helping them to develop, because that is to the interest of all of us. I have to wait and see what this new policy will yield, but hope springs eternal. How do you, uh, for example, help to stabilize Africa when you look at the U.S. foreign policy in the manner in which uh, it is promoted? There are critics who will say that uh, you are talking about uh, vital national security interests here uh, being uh, promoted at the expense of American values. We're talking about American values of rule of law, for example. We're talking about democracy here. We're talking about accountability. Yes, we're talking... We do not, hopefully, hopefully, we do not want to sacrifice our interest in our values, our interest in uh, human rights. We don't want to put those on the altar for commercial interest. And uh, that, that, that is really something that I believe that various organizations, uh, various NGOs, uh, we need to make sure that our voices are heard in terms of what kind of foreign policy we want uh, for the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis Africa. Ambassador Ray, how does that happen when a lot of observers say the U.S. is in the business of promoting dictatorship on the African continent? How, do, how does really an average American taxpayer benefit out of that? Well, I, I don't really know that I can say or that I would agree that we are promoting dictatorship on the continent. Uh, in fact, what I, what I think my observation, uh, and this is from, from uh, a, a remove since I've been out of government since 2012, is that we're really not, it's not so much that we are promoting dictatorships as it is our focus on competing with China. And the Chinese take a very, um, how should you put it, shortcut approach to working with a country that instead of working with the people they they're find the strongest pragmatic. they're very pragmatic they, they work with the dictators and right. so because our focus tends to be on competing with them there there's this there's this image that we are promoting dictatorship I think the problem is what we are it's not so much what we are doing as what we are not doing. We are not putting a strong enough emphasis on promoting rule of law on promoting participatory government and inclusion uh, and 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 we 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 are I, I I sense that we have this you're with us or you're with them <laughs> approach mm. uh, which which again it tends to create this image that quite frankly I don't think is is accurate I don't think it's so much that we we're promoting dictators as we seem to be saying to those people who are cozying up to the Chinese, mm. you join us or, you know, we're going to cut you off at the knees. And um, the, the unfortunate thing there is, 
if the Chinese are, have, have good relations with a dictator and we're focusing on trying to disrupt that relationship, mm -hmm. we're also sending a very negative message to the non-dictators. I mean, it's, 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 it's when you act, you have to remember that, that your, your intended audience is not the only audience that sees your actions. They're not the only audience that hear, mm. hears your words. So, so I, 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 would, I would disagree that we're promoting dictatorships. Really? I, think, I don't think we're promoting dictatorships. I think what we're doing is mm. we are we're, we're, we're creating conditions where dictatorships are thriving, and it's not an, and I don't think it's I an see. intended consequence. Our, our, our right. intent is to try and delink them from China. Mm. But we don't have the, okay, if we should happen to get them to dissolve their relationship with China, what next? I see. I'll give you an example. In the 1980s, for example, um, you did have uh, U.S. foreign policy supporting a one Mobutu Sese Seko was a banger yes. in the Congo. Oh, yeah. You, talk you in also the had uh, a Siad Bari, for yes. example, in yeah. Somalia. And as a matter of fact, I remember a man called Paul Manafort. Paul Manafort was confronted because he had actually been lobbying on behalf of some of those yes. dictators. And he said, yes, he may be bad. But he he's our be, bad. Be, yeah, a dictator, but he's our own bad dictator. Yeah. No, I, what has I, changed, really? Well, OK, first of all, we, we, have, to, we have to consider that we're talking two, com, two different eras. That was the era the Cold of the War. U.S. Soviet Cold War, which mm -hmm. was a sort of a socio-political mm -hmm. confrontation. What we're what we're in now. A, a friend of mine um, in, at an army base in Georgia and I were going back and forth, and he came up with the term Cold War II, mm -hmm. and I jokingly said it's more like Cold War 2.0 because <laughs> of the cyber <laughs> dimension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what we have now is a what I think is the beginnings of another Cold War, only it's not a bipolar, mm -hmm. it's more of a us against, it's a multipolar, and We're you have the China. Russians and the Chinese yes. as the two main players, and us, and it has as much of a, an economic dimension, mm -hmm. and then there's of course the sort of cyber dimension, social media and the like, mm -hmm. and we seem to be ill-equipped mm. to fight in this war. This is one Cold War where we're going in with one hand tied behind our back and, uh -huh. and the other and the, hand over our eyes. Right. So, so it's creating this impression that, I mean, I, like I said, it's, it, maybe in some people's minds it's creating the impression that we are supporting dictators. When, when in fact, I don't see that we're supporting anyone. I mean, we don't have a, we're for this. It's we're against the Chinese having primacy. We're against the Russians coming in here. So, you know, ignore them, come with us. But... But why not promote the values I which could no in fact you translate have no, you'd have to ask into long-term peace and stability? Because we don't have a long-term vision of what we want to see on the African continent. Competition with the Chinese is not a long-term strategy. That's mm. a short-term, we win, they lose. <laughs> long-term is, we win, they lose, now we've won. Let's, how are we going to rebuild this? We don't have that part of it. The values win democracy, for example. Because we haven't thought that far in advance. We're focusing now on how do we defeat the Chinese. During the Cold War, the United States sincerely was promoting democracy very aggressively in Europe. Yes. Behind the curtains. Yes. Why not Africa? Good question. I think we should. And, and I, think, I think on the ground, many of our ambassadors and our diplomats who work there do, in fact, promote it. Whether it's a long-term national policy or strategy is a good question. And, and as I said, since my personal observation is we do not have, nor have we ever 
had a long-term strategy or vision for Africa and the countries of Africa, then without that long-term vision, of course, it's not there. You know, we, we, we have not, our, our focus in Africa, even during the Cold War, okay, I mean, mm. even during, yes, we promoted democracy aggressively during the Cold War. But it was really more so about... It was to uh, defeat the Soviets. ...and extracting resources. Well, that too. And, and, but, but I mean, the primary focus was to win against the Soviet Union. And when the Soviet Union had to pack its bags, pick up its ball, and leave the field, what happened to all those programs? I see. Well... Um, let's go to the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone callers. Uh, I gather that uh, there is, uh, is it Gaffo or is it Tafo in Ghana? Hello, Shaka. Hello, is that Tafo? Yeah, that's Tafo from Ghana. Yes, how are you today? I'm good, Shaka. How are you too? I am hugely terrific. What is your question, please? Shaka, my question has to do with... Uh, you know, there's this Millennium Challenge Corporation that was set up to deal with the poverty and infrastructure challenges in Africa, especially in Ghana here. Uh, during the President Bush era, we used to hear a lot about them. But these days, it's hardly to hear from them. I don't know what is going on, whether they are still in existence or what is happening with the, that fantastic policy that American government set up to help Africa. What about Maybe our honorable ambassador will help us what with about this question. Thank what, you very much. What about that? Because the last time I checked, uh, I thought, in fact, Ghana was one of the more, uh, probably, uh, more lucky uh, recipients, in fact, of uh, the MCC. That's correct. Yeah. I, I think a couple of things have happened. MCC is still alive and well. Uh, there has been some movement to restructure the financial sector and how we do development overseas. MCC is a part of that conversation. It's called the BUILD Act. Mm -hmm. If your uh, constituent would go to the website and look at MCC, they're a part of this new process where we're looking at how we structure foreign development going forth. Uh, the MCC's uh, budget, I think, has come down. It's about all close to a billion dollars a year still. Uh, and they're continuing to do compacts and subcompacts. Uh, and I think Ghana has been a recipient of two. They're in their second compact now. I think it's an energy, That's true. which is one of the areas that is most important to Ghana to moving it uh, from an economic development perspective mm -hmm. to stop the brownouts. And at one and time, as a matter of fact, I think uh, they were one of the leading uh, countries in terms of accessing, you know, the grants. And they still remain very democratic, so it seems to me that uh, they still qualify. But yeah, they still qualify. They're still finishing up, if I believe. I don't have the data in front of me at this moment, but I know that they're finishing up their second compact, which is an energy compact on distribution uh, and generation, uh, which you notice you don't hear about a lot of the brownouts in Ghana anymore because mm. they're starting to, to curb some of the problems that were existing mm. from local production as well as generation. So mm. um, I think over the next year, you'll see a much more clarity from the government in regards to its assistance program. But the BUILD Act is one, and I think MCC is still very much involved in providing compacts to countries to help move them to the next level from an economic uh, development perspective. Very good. Let me come to you again, uh, uh, Ambassador Davis. Uh, of course, you prefer me to refer to yes, you I'm as Ruth. Ruth. <laughs> My sister Ruth. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, the promoting of democracy, for example, which is a good thing, really, because at the end of the day, it is an equal opportunity employer for everybody. Yes, right. For example, this administration is going very, very strong um, against what is happening in a country called Venezuela, mm. which is a good thing, because uh, they question the type of election, for example, they held there. What about a lot of other elections that have been held on the African continent, for example, that are clearly, clearly undemocratic? We're talking about, for example, the Republic of Rwanda and uh, President Paul Kagame. We're talking about Uganda and uh, President Yoweri Museveni. 
We're talking about Cameroon and Apollo Bia. We can go on and go on and go on. What can I say? What can I say? I mm. think you're right. Uh, it is incumbent upon us as some of the world's leaders in democracy to uh, help to ensure that uh, elections are held, that elections are, uh, are held properly. Are credible. Are credible, exactly. Are transparent, are verifiable. Exactly. And uh, this, this, this is an area that we need to pull our socks up and work on. You're absolutely correct. What about that, uh, um, Ambassador Ray? We're talking about elections in the, so many countries on the African continent, sincerely. When they are held, the results do not reflect the will of the people, but in fact, they reflect the will of the individual who announces the results or who counts the votes. <laughs> no, I, 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 I echo Ambassador Davis. What can I say? Uh, you're, you're, you're right. We need to do a much better job of working with these countries in, in the electoral process, and not just the voting, but the campaigning and, and, and the, whole, the whole range of the election access to related, media. access to media, uh, counting, uh, and that being transparency. But, but we need to do more than that. I mean, you know, elections don't make democracies. If, if having regular, well-run elections made democracies, right. North Korea would be the most democratic country <laughs> on earth. <Right. laughs> okay. Uh -huh. we, need to, we need to tie the front end and the back end of an effective functioning democracy to right. the electoral process. Right. And that is, that is education mm -hmm. uh, and job opportunities. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the peaceful transfer of power and the proper interaction of the winning and losing parties in elections and the involvement of the population or at least the franchised enfranchised population in evaluating those who were who are put in office mm -hmm. and so and and, and again I, I know I know it sounds like a broken record but it 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 requires having more of a long-term view and a vision of what it is we're trying to do. I was in the Accra uh, when then the then U.S. President Barack Hussein Obama addressed the entire continent from the Ghanaian Parliament, and I remember him talking about how Africa, for example, does not need strong men that it needs strong institutions. Yes. Right. But then what happened? There are people who say he merely talked the talk, but did not walk the talk. And he did have the opportunity to do it because, let's face it, the United States of America is the only superpower. Doesn't it, in fact, have an obligation, really, to ordinary people, for example, who live on a continent that is hugely, hugely worth, and yet people are so poor? Well, you know, that's, that's really a hard question to address uh, in the time that we have here, because, because you're, you're right. I mean, we are... A, a quote superpower how, however you define that we have a we have a very strong economy we have strong military uh, what's more important we have these strong governing institutions that enable us to to weather these occasional political hiccups we go through in this country mm -hmm. um, this is a society of laws it is a society of laws and let's hope it remains so <laughs> and and so what I think we, we need to, when we're working with countries, I mean, there's a tendency, and I, I was in government, including my military service, for a little over 50 years. 50 years? Yes. I, I know. I salute you, Major. <laughs> <laughs> 
but but I observed in that time that that we as a culture as a people society government however you want to define us have an unfortunate tendency we we go in we have this short term we want to get in get it done and go home and and we start working with someone to get something done and if they're not doing it quite the way we would do it or quite as fast as we would like mm. we'll just take over and do it ourselves mm. there's a problem with that though it, then it doesn't belong to them it belongs to us and when we leave it goes with us right right we we have yet to learn how to help other people identify what it is they need and facilitate them gaining what they need. We go in and tell them what they need and then we throw a little money at them to go buy it. So you have to it help never people works. to essentially learn how to help themselves. Yes. So that at the end of the day, let's face it, we are all on the same page. Yes. And and the point is that we we we've sometimes uh, there was a when I was in the army, we had a uh, a policy that lasted for a few years until it was decided it was really wrecking things called zero defects. Mm -hmm. And under zero defects, yeah. nothing could be wrong. I mean, if you were a commander, a military commander, and your unit was inspected and one thing was found wrong, your career was ended. Well, you know what that leads to? Mm. Everyone makes sure that everything is perfect on paper but then when you have to use it, it breaks. So we, we have this issue. We're working with a country, and, and let's take elections. We're working with a country that's never had elections before, and we want them to have that, very, that first election to be letter perfect. I, I'm sorry, but we've been having elections in this country for over 200 years, and I just point to some of our mm. recent in the last decade mm. elections and the debacle afterwards mm. there is no such thing as a perfect society there's just no such thing as a perfect election and we need to learn to take a step back what about just being fair fair is good and just and just That's is good. even better <laughs> <laughs> and we just need to be fair and just and 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 that means not insisting on perfection allowing people to make mistakes and helping them to stand up after those mistakes and allowing them to own their own problems. I see. Well, um, I'm told that uh, I probably have run out of time and uh, for that. On that note, thanks to today's guests, Ambassador Ruth Davis, Ambassador Charles Ray, and Alonzo Fulgham. Thanks to our audience for tuning into Street Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not better, Africa. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive. <laughs>